All right, so we continue with our uh, last week's uh, or last uh, lectures <coughs> sequence where we were discussing about the aircraft configuration. So we were here last time. Uh, Let us look at very briefly the important design features of the aircraft that we saw. Okay. Uh, first observation is that the wings are very slender, they are very high aspect ratio and the engines are pusher engines. By pusher engines, I mean the engines which are mounted behind. Okay. So they kind of push the aircraft forward as against what you normally see is called as a tractor in which the aircraft is pulled behind the engine. So uh, what would be the advantage of uh, high aspect ratio wings for an aircraft of this type? What benefit would you see for an aircraft of this type to have high aspect ratio? Yes, so anybody can answer aspect ratio, high aspect ratio, why? Why do we have high aspect ratio on an aircraft? Less induced drag. Less induced drag. Sure. And what is the benefit of that? Yeah. So you will have better fuel consumption, more efficiency. Okay. So you would like to give as high aspect ratio as you can provide. But what are the problems with high aspect ratio? Spectrally, not weak. It will be heavy because the weight is distributed more outstream or more outboard. So the moment arm will be larger for the same lifting capacity. Therefore, there will be larger bending moment at the root and hence you need to have a heavier structure. Any other problem with high aspect ratio? Why is it less maneuverable? See, in an aircraft design class, you cannot make a statement say, this is the case, but I do not know why it is. We are here to understand why, right. So if you do not know why, it is fine. That means either you do not know the reason or the argument is not correct. Okay. So think about it. Why, why would high, what would be wrong with, what is bad with high aspect ratio? One, I have already mentioned to you that uh, high aspect ratio winds tend to be heavier. What else? Large space to fly. It won't be able to pass through. It won't be able to pass through. Okay, so uh, more more clearance required on the ground. Yes, that is a problem. Anything else? Roll inertia is very high because more weight is outboard. Okay, so you are assuming that uh, the area is fixed, which is right, which we can expect. So okay, this is acceptable. There will be higher roll inertia, therefore higher resistance to rolling. So yes, now it makes little bit sense to me. Does it make sense to you? Okay, good. What else? Yes, higher flexibility and that leads to aeroelastic effects. So we would like to make a wing with as high aspect ratio as possible provided we do not have a constraint on the length or the wing span hmm, because that will give us higher aerodynamic efficiency. But only for those applications where induced drag is the largest component of drag. So for which kind of flight profile or for which kind of flight regime is induced drag the highest component of drag? Yeah, so when do we have high CL? When speeds are low. So an aircraft which is going to fly very fast. Induced drag will not be a large component. So for such aircraft, high speed aircraft, you do not need to give a large aspect ratio. Okay. What is the aspect ratio for space shuttle? Only 3, very low aspect ratio because it flies very fast. So when you look at low speed aircraft, now is this a low speed aircraft? What is the maximum speed? 315 knots, that is what they mentioned in the film. Yeah, so that is not a very high speed. Okay. It is not a very high speed. So, when you are looking at low speed aerodynamic efficiency during takeoff, during climb, and during low speed flight, 
then high aspect ratio is beneficial. But if the mission of the aircraft is predominantly in very high speed flight, then induced drag is not the bigger component and therefore induced drag reduction does not help. In fact, then the negatives of aspect ratio will take over <coughs> and they will start creating problems. So that is why we have to have aspect ratio selected very carefully. Okay. What is the advantage of pusher engines in this configuration? Less noise in not in the cockpit, less noise in the cabin. Okay. Less noise in the cabin, yes, because the engines are moved behind, propellers are moved behind. What else? Clean air on the wings, yes, clean air on the wings. So that helps in aerodynamic efficiency. Can now, difficulty in stalling the wings because the engine is essentially pulling the air from over the wings. Right. So if it stall in any case. Okay. So if I fly this aircraft at a very high angle of attack, you think the engine will still be able to attach the flow on the wings? The are in a sort energizing the air. They are. They are. They are creating suction. Now, when you have tractor, the engines are in the front and they are also blowing over. No, they are blowing from under the wing, they are not blowing from over the wing, they are usually at high angles, the flow separates. The air from ahead into below the wing and there is no effect from over the wing. The okay. other engines, the air will also be pulled from over the wing. Now, but why do you say that in a tractor, the, the flow, you are assuming that the engines are mounted below, which they are normally are. Okay. Right. So, yes, uh, in a tractor, definitely the engine acts like a suction, okay. But that will only help in energizing the flow. It will not be able to really help too much in avoiding separation. So, yes, it will help energizing the flow. So, when the flow tends to separate, the tendency will be less. However, we have a problem. Now, the propeller tips are near the fuselage, okay. So, there is going to be interference. There is going to be interference now between the propellers, fuselage and the wing section in that location. So, yes. Uh, they have made uh, some bottle, shape over there where the propeller tips are nearby. Yes, they have made a tapered shape there only for that reason. So, the design of the rear fuselage has been done keeping in mind there is going to be a tractor in, uh, engine. Okay. Uh, and then they have put these triangular uh, faces. Okay. So, pusher engines serve uh, multiple benefits in this case, the primary reason being the noise in the cabin and then uh, this particular aircraft. Now, do you notice that the wing seems to be very small as compared to other wings for a typical aircraft of this dimension? These are low area wings because they have invested a lot of research and development efforts in making it laminar flow. Hence, the wings are much more efficient. Okay. And therefore, if you want to have laminar flow on the wings and you want to have efficient wings, then you cannot have disturbed flow on it from the propeller or from uh, any other appendage. So that is why the engine has been moved behind. And the nacelle is very smoothly aerodynamically shaped in the front. Okay. Let us look at some other features. Observe. Now, I want you to observe. Observe things and then let us try to figure out. Some answers you may not have, some answers I may not have, does not matter, we will search the answers. So, this is a side view of the aircraft and what we see is that the canards have anhedral. It is a very mild anhedral, actually it is around 5 degrees of anhedral. So, these canards, first of all if you notice the angle of incidence of the canards or the angle at which the canards are mounted on the fuselage is also higher than the angle at which the wings are mounted in the fuselage. So, the angles are, the, the canards are always at a slightly higher angle of attack as compared to the wing. So, when the aircraft is flying, if the wing angle of attack is 4 degrees, the canard angle of attack is definitely more than 4 degrees. So, how will it help? Yes. So, what will happen is, that when the aircraft or if the aircraft reaches a stalling angle, canard would have reached the stall angle before it. Okay. And if the canard is made to stall before the wing, what is the benefit? <coughs> then the no, 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 no stability. The nose goes down because you lose lift in the front. So the nose goes down. When the nose goes down, the angle of attack decreases. So the tendency of the aircraft to go beyond stall is 
diminished. In other words, sometimes you can make an aircraft unstallable. It won't stall because before the wing can stall, the canard has stalled and brought the nose down. This is a very good safety feature. And Bert Rutan has mastered this technology in uh, providing designs such as uh, Very Easy and other aircraft. So you can read about Bert Rutan. He is a very distinguished designer, very famous aircraft designer. In his lifetime, he has designed more than 42 different aircraft, different aircraft. And only recently he retired. I think last year he took retirement. But he has been very active in bringing extremely innovative designs into uh, the aerospace field. Now, why do you have anhedral on the on the canard? Why should you have a slight lower angle? I mean, why is the canard not like this, but slightly like this? Can you figure out the reason? The answer lies in the picture. So now, just try to visualize what will happen if the canard is not given anhedral in this aircraft. The the flow will go over the wings or the wake of the canard will disturb the wing. Because there is anhedral, the wake of the canard is not disturbing the wings. It is going below because it is physically below. And you know that the wake, now it is physically below and at a higher angle of attack. Both these things will ensure that the wake of the canard is actually below. So the wind will be, now these kind of decisions are not taken in conceptual design normally. Okay? Normally the exact angle of anhedral and the exact location is decided by wind tunnel testing or by CFD analysis in the second stage of design called as the preliminary design. Because in conceptual design you are not really concerned, you, you, can, you can say that okay, we will give slight anhedral and we will give a slightly high incidence so that this happens. But how much will we give? 4 degrees, 5 degrees? That is decided through the primary design stage. Any other advantage of having an hydral? Apart from the wing, you also have the engine. And if the wake of the canard is going to hit the engine, the engine will have disturbed flow. <coughs> so by giving an hydral, you are keeping fuselage, sorry, you are keeping the, en uh, the engine, the wing, and also the tail, tail anyway is little bit up, away from the wake of the canard. So this is one interesting observation. Then this aircraft also has flaps in canards. Now Avanti uh, P-180 comes in two versions, Avanti 1, Avanti 2. In Avanti 2, if I am right, I do not remember exactly, the flaps in the canard deploy automatically when the flaps in the main wing are deployed. Okay, So you can see in this picture, the main wing flaps are deployed, as you can see here, they are down and there is also a deployment of the flaps in the nose one. So can someone reason out the advantage of this? Why should we have flaps in the canard? What benefit does it serve? Let us argue out systematically. When you deflect the flap in the main, main wing, what happens? What do flaps do? They increase the lift coefficient. Okay. Anything else they do? They have very high pitching moment. Is that nose down or nose up? Nose down. So when you deflect the flaps, you get higher CL. That is something you want, but you also get very high CM or the pitching moment, which is nose down. How is this how is this tackled? By Right. So, if the canard is not there, or if there is no flap in the canard, <coughs> then what do you do? What will you do? You will either increase the tail area to take care of the pitching moment, or you will increase the tail angle of deflection or the deflection of elevator, both of which will create weight, increase size, and more drag. Correct? So, in, a, in an aircraft like this, by putting flaps on the canard and by deflecting the flaps automatically when the main flaps are deflected or by having the canard flaps. What you are doing is you are creating a pitching moment which makes the tail small because now the tail does not have to do so much of work. Some part of the control work is being done by the canard. So by careful design, 
the total area of canal plus tail can be lower than that of just the tail. Okay. So, by using a three surface layout like this, one advantage I told you yesterday or last time was that you can trim the aircraft at much larger center of gravity range. The other advantage is a three surface layout carefully designed, very important, carefully designed that means with flaps in the canal and they also are in sync with the canal uh, with the main flaps, you might end up with a total area of can, uh, tail lesser than of a conventional tail. Why will it be less? It will be less because the moment arm for canal is much more than that for the tail. Correct? The tail is behind, but canal is much far for much forward. So a small deflection of the flap in the canal will give you larger moment because of the distance. So this is the this is the reason why in this aircraft they have gone for a three surface layout. Okay, then they have put these delta fins on the aerofoil shaped fuselage. We notice here that the fuselage is not a conventional fuselage. The fuselage itself is a very beautiful Naka type aerofoil shape. Like if you see the fuselage. Now, we do not normally see such fuselages in transport aircraft. What we see is some kind of a nose and then a fairly constant portion and then we see a tapered boom on the back. In this case, we are seeing curvature right from the nose up to the maximum thickness and then back it is real. So, this is a fuselage which has been designed almost like an aerofoil cross section. Although it is not a 2D body, so it is not an aerofoil cross section per se, but it is a, it's a very beautifully shaped fuselage. The aim uh, of the designers was to come up with extremely low uh, turbulence or a uh, very large area of laminar flow on the fuselage. In typical fuselages, we do not expect laminar flow to sustain more than about 5-10% of the fuselage length. In this case, they claim that 25% of the fuselage length has laminar flow. And drag in laminar flow is much lower than turbulence drag. In turbulent flow, you know that it is nearly one third. So, but you have to be very careful, you have to ensure that there are no projections, there are no deformities which trip the flow from laminar to turbulent. Because laminar flow may be good in drag, but it is highly unstable. Turbulent flow may have more drag, but it is highly stable. It does not separate very easily. So, in this case, they have gone to extreme length of making the fuselage like an aerofoil and they have put these delta kind of fins on the rear fuselage. So, now I want you to figure out why are they there. They will give roll stability. How will they give roll stability? So, they are flat plates and they will act like a brake during roll. Okay. Any yes? So, I think roll stability would not be a greater point because they have a high expect ratio in so obviously there. So, then I think it is a time for you to now figure out the reason and put on the Moodle page. Okay. So, Hemant, you are requested to open a link on Moodle where people will comment on this aspect of this aircraft and also on more aspects. Okay. Please reinforce or counter the discussion that I have done in the class. If you find something I have said is wrong, point it out. If you want to augment it with some more information, some you might get somewhere some internal data, or you might get some other information. So let us learn more about this beautiful aircraft. Okay. So uh, I expect you to support or reinforce all the points that I am discussing. All right, let us go ahead. Uh, this we have already seen okay, that the engine is mounted behind. Not only that, even the wing is mounted behind. Okay. The wing is, so the cabin is entirely ahead of the wing and the engine. So with this, the noise level inside the cabin is actually very low. Piaggio claims that the noise level inside the cabin is only 68 decibels. Okay. Whereas the permitted noise level is much higher than 68. So it is very quiet they claim. But there is a problem. The interference of the flow from the propeller, wing, fuselage and these delta, they create very high noise for the people outside. 
So this is not a very friendly aircraft for the airport. Many airport authorities have said this is the noisiest aircraft flying in our airport. So the, the noise level inside is low, but the neighborhood noise level is much higher. And that is one reason why at least one airport in Florida I know, uh, I have seen this aircraft in Blacksburg also. So I have seen it land and take off. But um, there are many people who say that you are good for the passengers inside, but you are bad for the neighbors. Okay. So that issue has to be sorted out. Now I will tell you how they have tackled this issue. Okay. So what they have done is, this aircraft uh, was a very popular aircraft, there were you know, 30 of them sold in 2008, but then slowly there was a tapering of the sales. And then last year, uh, this company came up with a new avatar of Avanti called as the Avanti Evo. Okay. So this is the old Avanti which we have just now seen and this my friends is the new Avanti, Avanti Evo launched last year. So what differences do you see in the two configurations? Yes, what is it? The tail. There is some change in the tail. What change do you see? Three panel of the tail. Okay, it, this might be a, this might be an illusion because of the angles. We are not sure about it. I mean, I cannot be sure just by the picture that the tail is greatly different. So I don't want to comment. Maybe the tail is a bit smaller. Obviously, when an aircraft goes into service life, only then the designers actually come to know whether there is a slight over design or under design. If they have found that the tail was slightly larger, you could make it smaller, then they might have made it smaller because they are making a new aircraft. Fuselage shape, is there any change? It's not visible towards the end. Uh, Winglets, that is prominently clear. Okay, winglets are there. Okay, so why are winglets used? We will see in the next slide, but let me just get some idea from you. So, tell me in this aircraft, why would you like to provide winglets? You change the lift distribution. How can you change lift distribution by winglet? They are blind. Yeah, explain. Downwash we can change. Downwash at uh, the tips. See, downwash is there throughout the wing, but it's the strongest at the tips. Okay, so that is where the two flows can meet and they can curl into a big vertex. So yes, you can manipulate that by putting a well-designed winglet. Agree. So the drive, uh, the need for winglet is further attempt to have cruise efficiency by manipulating the wing tip vertices which will be there you cannot avoid them but you can weaken them okay any other observation so why don't you tell me on moodle read about avanti evo it's a new aircraft launched last year only and read about avanti piaggio uh, p180 and tell tell us on the moodle page what are the key differences in these two aircraft is there any way different? So you will then learn what kind of market perceptions or what kind of market requirements have come in the last few years which have forced these people to modify their design. Nobody will modify a design just like that. They will do it for a reason. So let us learn. From what they did, we will learn on what normally happens. Okay. So to me, just the winglets are the predominant change which are absolutely visible, no doubt about that. Other things I will not be able to comment much just by looking at the picture. So I would I look forward to getting input from you on the Moodle page. Okay. So we discussed about winglets. So winglets basically are a good way of increasing the effective aspect ratio without actually making the wingspan larger. You can make wingspan larger by increasing the aspect ratio, right? You can make, or I should say the other way around. You can increase the aspect ratio by making wingspan larger, but then you have span limitations. So what you can do is by putting a winglet at the end, you are kind of increasing the span, but not really increasing the span. So the effects are as if it's a high aspect ratio without getting 
more spans. So it is nearly equivalent to the span extension without the root bending moment increase which is the problem with higher span. Then uh, we all know that you can control the flow at the wing tip to reduce drag. In fact, there are reports that some people are able to make a winglet which gives you negative drag. Okay, but I do not know how we can have how you can have a situation where there is negative drag because that is against laws of physics. Huh? But still, there are some people who claim that by very careful design of the winglet, you can actually reduce uh, the drag so much that actually you can get thrust at the tips. But please understand, it is easy to say that okay, let us put a winglet. But the designer of the winglet, how many members will you put? Will you put only like this or will you put a member on the bottom also? All this requires very careful design, very careful analysis, CFD analysis, wind tunnel testing. And the local flow field is very, very non-uniform. Therefore, it is not easy. It is not easy to design a good winglet. You can easily get it wrong. You might end up with creating, because winglet means you put more material. So therefore, there is more weight. And you know, that winglet also will have more drag because it is uh, additional material in the flow field. Now, it should manipulate the flow in such a way that the reduction in the drag because of weakening of the wing tip forces is far more than the increased skin friction drag of the winglet. So, you have to be very careful in the design. And then there are also elastic problems because now you are putting a mass at the tip. Okay. Maybe it is beneficial because maybe it is not. What about the road inertia? So, if it is an aircraft like this, we will not require to roll very rapidly. You might say does not matter. We can overcome by putting slightly larger aileron or more powerful aileron. But one has to look at all these aspects. So, one of your seniors is actually working in a company which took this project of taking an existing aircraft and putting a winglet on it and then commenting to the design team whether it is beneficial or not. So, it is not easy, it is very it is very difficult to do. So, you require a lot of rigorous uh, CFD analysis, wind tunnel testing, etc. Okay. The other thing that we would like to know about is thrust vectoring. Okay. So, thrust vectoring obviously improves the performance okay. and uh, it also allows you to have vertical takeoff and landing. And one of the most famous aircraft which has vertical takeoff and landing in the recent times is the F-35. Okay. Now, uh, watch very carefully how things are, almost like an orchestra, things are going to come and open when you have thrust vectoring. So, it is a very short video, you will miss it very soon. So, there it starts, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These 5 things have to simultaneously operate and operate correctly. Only then the aircraft is able to get a thrust vectoring capability. I will show you to you once again because it is blink and miss type thing. I will show you once again. Observe, observe. First the doors open on the bottom, then on the top and then the flapper doors open and it lifts up vertically. Now we will study about this aircraft in much more detail through one of our films. We are going to screen a film where we learn more about F-35. I just want you to see a brief sketch of how this aircraft acquires thrust vectoring. Before this, the only aircraft which was in commercial production in military and had thrust vectoring was the Harrier, AV-8B Harrier. You know about this aircraft, right? The AV-8B Harrier was the only aircraft. It acquired thrust vectoring purely and purely by vectoring the nozzles. So therefore, um, it was very important uh, in the design of AV-8B to have the nozzle right at the center of gravity. So that the thrust vectoring does not give you moments. In this design, the designers took a very, very innovative approach. They said, we cannot have a system which is very reliable and just depend on one vector or one big vector and two small vectors at the tips. It is very highly unreliable and many accidents took place in Harrier also. So what they said is, we will go for a dedicated lift fan which is this one and this lift fan friends is mounted vertically. It takes air from top 
and throw from the bottom. That is why you have to have all those things opening for it. So first the bottom doors open, then the top doors open, allowing. And interestingly, this is driven by a very long shaft attached to the main engine. So the main engine has this very long transmission and that transmission drives the lift engine and plus you have these two small nozzles on the sides to give you downward. So now you have four forces. One is the 90 degree deflection of the nozzle at the back through an elbow nozzle. We saw that in the film. That gives you vertical force at the back. That vertical force is roughly balanced by the pure vertical force by the lift fan in the front. And for sideways control, there are these two small nozzles. So two big nozzles and two small nozzles. On these four nozzles, this guy dances and has a pure vertical takeoff and landing. Now this is a huge innovation risk that the design team took. If this did not work, they would have lost the competition. But it worked and they were lucky. So they were successful in doing it. Okay. Now let us look at a little bit about transportation economics and in a productivity issues because after all air, aircraft are designed in the civilian service to make money. They should be productive. They should give airlines more bang for their buck. So what has happened? Have we really moved drastically? So in mid 60s we had this 747 which was considered to be a path breaking aircraft. It had some productivity. The productivity is measured in passenger miles per gallon. How many passengers you carry? over how many miles distance divided by how much fuel you use in gallons. This ratio can be considered to be a good measure of productivity because you could take more passengers but fly short distances. You could take more passengers, fly longer but consume more fuel. You could actually fly more passengers very efficiently but not travel more distance. So passenger miles per gallon is a good indication. We want more passengers, we want more miles, we want less gallons. So from a number of 60 for 747 in mid 60s, all we have seen till about mid 90s is just a 50% improvement. But 50% improvement is not a small number. 50% improvement is a large number. So during this time, it is the same aircraft 747. So the aircraft has not changed. What has changed is you have dash 100, dash 200, dash 300. What has changed? Where has the improvement come from? Some improvement? Engine side, yes. So, there are much better engines available. So, over these, uh, you know, 30, 40 years, the engine people are not keeping quiet. They are constantly improving the engines. So, the same engine is constantly being improved to have 2%, 3% improvement every year in the fuel efficiency, etc. So that is one contributory factor. That will hit the denominator. It will reduce the per gallon. Then, what kind of modification? For example, they increased the kilometer size by reducing lavatories. So that was one minor which added for passengers. That, that's a slight bump you see over there. Mm -hmm. Hang on a minute, hang on a minute. This slight bump that you see on the top is basically the extended upper deck, which is there in 747-100 also. But what they have done? Now, look, if you increase the number of passengers, you cannot reduce the number of lavatories because there is a regulation about, or there is not a regulation, but there is an industry norm about how many, how many lavatories are to be there per group of people. Okay. So you cannot arbitrarily say knock the lavatories off, knock the valley off, don't supply water, don't supply magazines, don't supply food and put more passengers. You cannot do that because what will happen is in the market the airline will lose business. People will not fly that airline. So they cannot make money. So then how have they gone for 747-100-370 seats to 747-200-452 seats? How did they put so many more seats? Yes, they have stretched the fuselage. We have studied about this. This is called a stretching. But at the same time, they have gone for either a change in the engine, but outwardly the aircraft looks very similar except for the length in change. 
okay. So, when you design the aircraft, you actually design it with so many variants in mind already. I will discuss this part more detail little bit later. Now, let us look at some novelty, some totally new concepts, which I am sure you must have seen if you are enthusiastic and then you would have wondered why is it like that, okay. One example is blended wing body, which is now becoming a very big uh, point of interest. Many airline, uh, many aircraft companies are looking at blended wing body designs. This design was suggested by uh, Bob Liebeck from Douglas Aircraft Corporation, a company which has now been bought over by Boeing. Earlier we had McDonnell Douglas, so that that also was McDonnell and Douglas, right? So there was one basic company called Douglas Aircraft Corporation. In that there was a chap called Bob Liebeck, and this guy has suggested why not go for a blended wing body? Because there is no fuselage. See, a fuselage of an aircraft, what does it do? What is the work of the fuselage? It is just a tube that is filled with the payload and it contributes to surface area, it contributes to weight, it contributes to drag. But it gives you length so that the control surfaces are sufficiently far away, it gives you volume so that the people can be accommodated. Other than that, it is nothing. Right? It does not generate too much lift, in fact only dry. It does generate some lift, but very less. Close to 90 percent of the lift will come from the wings and remaining from the remaining part of the aircraft. So why not forget the fuselage and stuff people inside the wing itself? So what will happen is, you will not have this unnecessary member which is only a paper carrier. Then some people, they feel very suffocated in a very long cabin. They would like to have a wide cabin like a classroom to move. In a typical aircraft, that is all. This is the cabin. But suppose this is the cabin, then people can little bit walk. You can have a theatre kind of a thing. You can actually screen a movie inside during a flight because everybody is watching like a cinema hall. Correct? So many people are happy to have a dispersed cabin rather than a long cabin. But it is not very easy. So what are the problems with this configuration? Because of which we are not seeing it yet. Manufacturing. Why is it difficult to manufacture? Because, because you feel you can make fuselage easily, it is circular cross section, yes. One way I agree with you that yes, you know, fuselage is something which can be made separately, symmetrical sections, we may have the same frames, you know, along the length. Okay, so that is one reason, but it is a very feeble reason, it is not a very predominant reason, it is not the main reason why we do not see this, yes. The existing airport infrastructure may not be able to support a much wider network. Uh -huh. So, uh, so uh, your point is that this aircraft is likely to be much wider than the conventional. It will be because people who are along the length are now pushed and dispersed along the width. So, it will be wider. So, there will be wingspan consideration. So, existing airport infrastructure may not be able to handle this aircraft. Okay. Again, it is a point which is acceptable. Yes. I, I do not see how it matters to do a lot of maneuvers because there is but you know, you do not want a transport aircraft to do a lot of maneuvers. So if it has got low maneuverability, it is all right. The kind of maneuverability you need, it will probably be, yeah, but that is a problem. You are right. Providing sufficient control authority on this aircraft is a problem because the movement arms are less, okay. In this case, for example, where is the horizontal tail? It is not there. So the only the portion behind the engine you can put some flat surface and you have you can put rudder in the two edge on the two wing tips. So you are right in saying that the controllability of the aircraft can be a problem. Okay. But these three reasons are okay, but they are not very strong reasons. There is one fundamental reason why we do not see this. Yes. Weight may drastically increase because it is a whole wing which contains which height may be missing. The passengers from, means, ah. the wing. Okay, so therefore, 
No, no. You can, in fact, on the other hand, one of the selling points of this aircraft is you can design it structurally efficiently. It's called as a span loader concept. In a fuselage, a wing configuration, you actually have a concentrated load on the fuselage from the passengers and then you have lift on the wings. Okay. Here, you are giving relief in bending moment everywhere. Throughout the wing, you, earlier you were putting hinges below the below the wings to give relief. Now I am putting people <laughs> in the wing to give bending moment relief. Structurally, it is much superior. It's easier and much superior structurally. Yes. I think there are safety issues as well. Like? Uh, like the engines are engine is directly compared. It's not away from the main body. As well, if it lands in the conventional bay, I think there there would be. Okay, so the engine is located behind the passengers. Now, there are many transport aircraft which have got tail mounted engines. So, they also touch or almost are behind. Engine is behind here. Okay. There is a safety issue, but not to do with the engine. It's, yeah, for is fuel. Where do you put the fuel? Now, people are near the fuel because the same wing. So, you might say, Okay, outward portion of the engine, of the wing, where you cannot put people because the, the height is very small. From there onwards, so somewhere here, from this kink portion, from here to here, we will put fuel. From here to here, we will put people. Okay, so you can get away a little bit, but still, fuel is in close proximity of the passengers. In a normal aircraft, it is in the wings, which are attached separately. So, it is little bit far away. Here it's just next door, so that can be a problem. Yes, you have some point. You have some point. No, no, no. Computationally, it is just a challenge to the people. I mean, students like you should not say it is difficult computationally. For you, anything should be easy to design. Given a problem, you can always create the grades and always create the mesh and do the CM or uh, or, or CFD analysis. No, that is not. I will not buy the argument of less computationally. You know. Hmm. Why do you think so? It will be actually higher. Delta wing is lower. Ah, okay. So now you are saying that you are moving towards delta wing. Yes. So the difficulty of delta wing, like L by D, will come into play. Okay. But uh, at L by D depends basically on two things, L and D. Now I'll show you an example of how you can you can tackle the L by D problem even in this configuration. I'll not tell right now. I'll explain it when I come to that slide. Yes. I suspected the same thing because high surface area. Yes. So, look, there are two drag components induced predominantly. We have to forget about wave drag, etc., because we will not fly supersonic. Now, if I reduce induced drag by a large margin and I give a little bit more surface uh, spin friction drag, the total drag may be less. How do you know? How do you know that, you know, so it is a trade off. So, what we need is D, not D induced or D uh, surface friction. We need total D. If I can reduce total D, what is the problem? So, I will give you a hint. The basic problem is safety. What is that problem? In case of emergency, the cannot come outside. That is the problem. That is exactly the problem. In case of emergency, it is very difficult to exit from a cabin where people are dispersed laterally. When people are dispersed longitudinally, you can build doors along the side over the wing, you can make some window as emergency exits and then people can run forward or backward and get out. Here it will be helter skelter. Okay? So, you will be surprised to know that inability to prove that people can, now how much is the time given? Okay, 90 seconds is for certain emergency situation, normally it is 3 minutes. Okay. So, let us not argue right now 90 seconds, whatever time is given. In that time, now if you want to carry this, if you want to make it efficient, you have to make it large, 1000 seater, 800 seater. People were not able to show that 800 people can be safely evacuated in the time available in the configuration like this. So, that was one major, that is one major reason why we do not see this aircraft 
actually operational. Although all manufacturers are trying to study, this is a problem which is open for research. I mean, I'm not saying we, we will never see it because this egress. Today, it's not uh, seen because uh, today people are saying that egress is going to be a problem in this. Okay. Now, all the planes that you see now, X48 series of planes recently, they are all going to be of this type now. Many UAVs that you see are well going to be of this type. Yes, you had a question. You can put flaps. You can put flaps on this portion, right? This portion of the wing can have flaps on the. So what can you do is you can put a reflex in the, in the shape of the wing itself. So you have tailless aircraft which land. How do they land? They have a regular reflex camera at the trailing edge. So by that they create a moment which overcomes a moment because of flaps. So there are ways available. They are not conventional ways. Okay. And therefore, because it is that is why it is unconventional, because you have to look at it afresh in new ways. Okay. Have you seen something like this? This is an oblique wing. The two wings are not symmetrically angled. It's like you have uh, you have a swivel. Okay. And the, now, what would be the advantage of this? Why should why should you have a wing like this? And there is a hint already there in the title. It's a supersonic transport aircraft. One of the applications. Yeah. So you can you can have sweep, but why do you have to give oblique? No, no, no. Don't think that this will swivel and become straight. No, no. It will permanently remain like this. <laughs> I like this argument. But when you are when you are taking off, put the wings symmetric. When you are going supersonic, it will go again. No, it remains fixed like that. That would be too much. See, a lifting surface, which is carrying all the load. Imagine the load on the bearing, which is going to control it. It's going to be very difficult to design. So the wing does not move. The wing remains fixed like this. The CM moves uh, when you are going to. Okay, the center of. Uh, yeah. So the aerodynamic center moves behind at 50% of the cord. Okay. Take a normal uh, straight, normal wing uh, without any public, mm -hmm. then uh, it will definitely move. If you make it like this, then the moment will cancel out. Like, like yeah, so for one wing, it is going to move, for that, also going to move. So, how will it cancel? How will it cancel? It won't cancel, <laughs> it will move on both. So now try to refresh your basic aerodynamic analysis or studies about what problems are we facing in transonic flight or supersonic flight and what is done. Okay. Huh. It is a combination of forward and backward ship, I agree. What is the advantage? Okay. So you want to have a situation where one wing has no separated flow and the other wing has separated flow. Then you'll have a flip. <laughs> if you if you have a situation like that, you are creating asymmetry. Asymmetry will create moments. Okay. So this is homework. Find out. Huh? This is a very interesting uh, configuration. We don't see it. It's not very popular. It's it's unconventional. The answer lies in the distribution of area along the length which becomes sudden if you have a normal wing, even with sweep. So you have only fuselage area. If you just plot the cross-sectional area from the nose to the tail, you will have slow increase and then sudden increase when there is a wing, then a drop when there is no wing, and then you again have a normal one and then drop when there is a tail. Here you will have more even distribution because wing will start and end over a longer distance. So the area of the wing will be distributed over a longer length. Okay. So this was given by R. T. Jones of NASA, and there is also a flying wing version. But read about it and educate us about oblique wing. So I request you please to find out uh, about this wing, whether something has been built, whether some aircraft have been uh, tested. I would like to know about it. Okay. Then we also have uh, a new approach is to have not one aircraft but two aircraft. Built together. Any example comes to your mind? One is that you have an aircraft with a space shuttle on top of it. 
like like uh, buran etc that is just a transporter okay that is also mother water configuration but that is a unique kind of an aircraft so oh, any anybody knows about any aircraft in recent times which made huge news which were of this type what is it no ramjet is just an engine so there is no mother and daughter in the engine this is like two aircraft joined together twin fuselage twin fuselage twin fuselage is no mother lighter there are two brothers my <laughs> 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 daughter means one is small a baby and one is large okay like a mother carrying a baby in the arms is same so there must be a reason for it right have you not heard about this aircraft which recently made news what is this this is spaceship 1 but what does it do it's a mother for this small aircraft correct so white knight is the name of the mother and spaceship one is of the daughter so the daughter sits on top of the mother okay now this aircraft is meant for what what is the design requirement of spaceship one low earth orbit correct correct so this aircraft is designed to allow people like you and me experience space flight so it's very expensive and difficult for us to go on a rocket like astronauts or cosmonauts very very expensive and very difficult but you want to experience space flight basic curiosity and you need not have to go into outer space even low earth orbit 100 km from the earth you enter into near space and you have a uh, lot of people who want to experience flight in that near space so this aircraft was designed to allow you to have that so basically the white knight or the mother is basically a carrier for the aircraft so the spaceship one is a rocket powered aircraft you can see the nozzle on the back right you see a nozzle on the back it's a rocket so it's a rocket powered aircraft it sits on the mother both of them are launched and the white knight takes it to a particular altitude i think the altitude is around 65000 feet i am i may be wrong plus or minus but not very high and then it is released and when the rocket is fired in the spaceship one for about 9 minutes if i am not wrong and during that 9 minutes it enters once it reaches about 100 km altitude it gives people a few minutes 5 6 10 minutes of experience in space and then it becomes a glider because once the rocket engine is over there is no propulsive system in between the mom has already come home she has landed now our baby is in the sky and then she is coming down and you know you, you can see these huge things there is a hinge here this is a huge feathering hinge so this aircraft had a very novel way of entering uh, uh, sorry of handling the reentry problem by increasing the drag and to do that the rear of the aircraft completely has a 90 degree bend as if that the aircraft is allowed is can break and come into land like a glider okay so i would like you to look at this particular aircraft more closely it's a wonderful design uh, this is a very good example of how somebody can have a mission profile and how someone can think of how to design the aircraft for the mission profile okay and we have a huge amount of literature on this there are there is actually a documentary on youtube which i can try to link if possible but you can find out i mean you don't have to depend on me for searching for youtube documentaries okay so you are far more experienced than me in watching youtube videos so you should look at this white knight spaceship one videos they are fantastic videos in one of the classes i actually had an assignment in which i made the students watch the documentary and then there was a quiz on the documentary do you want to have the same thing no okay fine no problem <clears throat> i will not force anything on you if you don't want it it's fine now another new configuration which is coming uh, very much near to closure nowadays is called as a strut based wing 
this is not a new concept actually. This particular sketch is actually given by uh, the proposer called Werner Fenning many, many years ago. In mid 50s, this concept was given. So what is, what is so special in this configuration? So looking at the picture, can you just point out? What do you think is very special? What is? There are two wings, okay. So this is like there is one wing on the top, one on the bottom which meets somewhere here, okay. Actually it is not two wings, it is one wing on the top which is supported or structurally supported by a strut. So when you support a wing with a strut which goes from the wing to the fuselage, it is called as a strut brace. Many aircraft have such configuration. For example, Cessna 172, Cessna 152 which are very commonly used for pilot training, they all have strut braced wing. So what we do in strut bracing basically is we give a structural support to the wing. See the wing is normally a cantilever, what you see is normally a cantilever, a single wing coming out from the fuselage. So all the loads which come, all the lift loads will tend to have a bending moment. So the wing will tend to flip because of the bending moment. If you connect, if you connect a member from the fuselage to the wing or, or a strut, if you brace it with a strut, you provide a structural support to the wing. So the wing will not hang like this, it will have a strut from here on the top will support it. Now the strut allows a thinner wing without a weight penalty. Otherwise, I can make a thin wing, but then I will have more weight penalty. I will have to make a, the, fuse, uh, the fuselage stronger because of the larger bending moment. So, uh, if you want to fly faster and faster beyond the typical speeds that you see today of Mach 0 0.8, 0 0.82, if you want to go into transonic range or if you want to fly at that Mach number also more efficiently, then this kind of configuration allows you to have less sweep. So it will be less sweep, but it will be high speed aircraft and it allows many, many improvements are possible. So in mid 50s, this uh, design engineer suggested the concept, but to make it work, you need MDO techniques, multidisciplinary design optimization techniques have to be studied and mastered because there are multiple disciplines playing a role structures, aerodynamics, flight mechanics, controls, they are all actively involved here. So you cannot just do it by conventional design. So <clears throat> there is a huge project in Virginia Tech funded by Lockheed Martin and NASA and Virginia Tech as the basic educational or the academic institute and they are working on this configuration called as a strut based wing. So their studies have shown that you can have much lower fuel consumption, much lower weight take off weight and because the engine is small, you will have less noise and less emissions for the same mission profile. So they took a conventional mission profile and they designed for that a strut based wing to meet the same requirements and then our one to one companion shows that there is going to be a larger improvement. So just by putting a strut. Now this strut is going to have additional drag, some member which is exposed to flow. But by allowing a smaller wing, a wing with larger aspect ratio, hence lower induced drag, the net benefit of this is to have a better aircraft. So this uh, project was very much appreciated and uh, recently uh, when I visited there in 2010, they were working on this configuration, which was a slight. So they were optimizing it from many angles, okay. And uh, I don't know the current status. You can check up if you want what is happening now. But this is a very interesting concept, and there is a good chance that in near future, because the departure from the conventional aircraft is very less. The only thing that will happen is you'll have a very narrow wing, but that narrow wing can be supported by the strut. All right. Let's look at a few other things. <clears throat> One of the basic problems in uh, supersonic flight is the sonic boom. What is sonic boom? 
Can somebody answer? Yes, can you answer? What is sonic boom? Can you answer? Yes. So what happened when we cross the sound barrier? What is sonic boom? When a shock is created, okay. So whenever you have a shock, you have sonic boom. So the person behind you, can you answer? Yes, can you answer? What about your neighbor? Have you heard of the term sonic boom? Just heard about it. What do you know about sonic boom? Okay, when the aircraft flies supersonic, then you will not hear the noise of the aircraft before it reaches. But that's not sonic boom. What you are saying is that because the speed of sound is lower than the aircraft speed, the aircraft arrives first before the sound. That's not the boom. That is not sonic boom. What is sonic boom? Yes, what is sonic boom? So what is noise basically? Pressure, pressure pulse. Okay. So the coalescing of the shock wave and hitting of that wave on the ground, that is very more important. If there is a shock wave at very high altitude, it may dissipate and there will be no boom. But if you are sufficiently near the ground and you fly supersonic and if the if the, if the if the shock wave on the aircraft hits the ground or any object on the ground like a building or a glass etc., there is a sudden pressure pulse which is created. This pressure pulse moving at a high speed creates a boom kind of a sound. And many uh, people complain of shattering of window panes or even damage to property shaking of the buildings because of a very strong sonic boom. So this is one big impediment in having sonic or supersonic flight available for passengers. In civilian applications, when you might be forced to fly near the ground or over populated places, sonic boom is one very major constraint. So there are lots of uh, research groups who are working on how to mitigate the sonic boom effects. So there will be supersonic flow, there will be shock wave, there will be pressure, but by some mechanism you can reduce the effect of that on the ground. So this is one aircraft which was a modified F5E. F5 was a very popular aircraft, but it's very old. It's already retired now from the service. Okay. So, uh, in 2003, they had a low sonic boom. So, basically, shaping of the aircraft can be attempted to reduce the pressure generated by the shock wave. So, this is like now something like aerodynamic tailoring, but you are tailoring the shape from the boom effects. So, there are lots of people who are studying these uh, attempts, uh, there are many attempts being made to reduce. Okay? So this is one more thing about which I want to know from you. What are the current, uh, what are the current efforts in trying to bring in supersonic passenger flight? Okay? So there was an article recently in the newspaper about the uh, attempts to bring Concorde-like aircraft back into service. So they will face this problem of sonic boom. So, how was the sonic boom problem tackled in Concorde aircraft? That's it. They were not allowed to fly over land. So, is that a problem? What is the problem? Longer routes. Why longer routes? You can? You can just fly high, but, but when you come into land, of course, you are never flying supersonic when you come into land. You are always at very low speeds. So what happens is when you do not, when you do not permit the aircraft to fly supersonic when it is over the land, okay? Now, 
we might say that at very high altitude the sonic boom effect may be less but we don't know it's a special wave uh, of course the wave has got some attenuation with atmosphere but it may not happen okay. so therefore the solution that was not solution but constraint was don't fly supersonic over land due to this there were severe restrictions on the routes that they can follow so if they want to come to mumbai they have to come only from the sea if they want to go to delhi from mumbai they cannot because the whole journey is not over water but they could come from some other place to mumbai as long as they come over the sea route so this puts a severe restriction on the operability of the aircraft you cannot tell the airline don't fly this route fly that route only that's very constraining there may not be passengers in the route where you can fly the where people are there you want to fly there and you can't fly because of the restriction so there are people who are trying to mitigate the sonic boom so one of the main problems in bringing supersonic flight back and making it efficient is to handle this so i want to learn from you what are the current attempts being made to handle supersonic uh, uh, to handle the sonic boom okay now the shape of things to come is basically unmanned aircraft the aircraft which i showed you f35 lightning 2 it is said widely believed that that is the last aircraft that the us government is going to fund which will be a manned fighter aircraft after this the us government may not fund any activity any bomber or fighter which is manned they are only going to fund unmanned aircraft so this is one example of a unmanned aircraft the ucav the uninhabited combat air vehicle it's a combat aircraft so it does or it is required to do almost everything that a combat aircraft does including tracing the enemy shooting the enemy down in the air on the ground intercepting all the activities now look at the configuration the moment you remove the human being from the cockpit you remove many constraints in the design so what are the constraints which get removed when there is no human being on the ground hmm? what is it first thing is there is no problem of fuel tanks now so you are freeing the people because see anyway hang on a minute anyway in military aircraft we have fuel tanks in the fuselage so we are talking about see we are not talking about unmanned passenger aircraft right now that is very far away why is it far away i am not convinced yet whether i would like to fly in an aircraft which is being piloted remotely or autonomously you can fly if you wish but i don't want to because there is a perception of safety in that okay today if there is a human being in the cockpit maybe like libnits that person may commit intentional suicide and take their aircraft to the alps that can happen it happened recently right so there are questions there also and there is a recent uh, study where the co-pilot of the aircraft is a machine so there is a pilot and a robot so people are attempting to do it but we are far away from that because we are we are primarily given governed by safety when we look at transport aircraft so we will not talk about that right now let's talk about military aircraft now in military aircraft during combat scenarios earlier we used to have human being on board a pilot on board now we have removed the pilot let us say so what is the advantage yeah. hmm? what is it because of because there is a pilot so you cannot exceed some of the g force limits uh, after that the pilot would have a blackout no but there is an answer to that there is a pressure suit available yeah, yeah so that pressure suit the ability of uh, correct it only extends the pressure suit is only going to take it to some value structurally i can design the aircraft for larger g's okay with a with a with a pressure suit i can push the limit of the human being better but i cannot probably go for very high g's so one restriction is removed about the g's okay what else cockpit has lots of this uh, tiles and other structures So what does cockpit have? Cockpit has lots of 
Okay, dials, display, etc. Now we don't have dials nowadays. Nowadays we all have glass cockpit. Okay, but okay. I understand that there are many things for the pilot to visually acquire on the cockpit. All of them can be trashed. Hmm. Oxygen system, air conditioning system, pressurization system. So the whole thing is called as the environmental control system. Not needed. It is a huge weight penalty and cost penalty. And these systems, they start failing more often than the wing or the structure. Recently we heard that this joint strike fighter was grounded mainly because of oxygen system. So things were okay otherwise, but in the cockpit there was a problem with the oxygen system. What else is the benefit if you do not have a pilot? Limited liability. Limited liability, yes, because you are not, li I mean there is no human being on board, so you are you feel less worried about safety. Even in case you crash, crashes somewhere, hmm. earlier with the pilot, if the pilot survives, you can't just disown the pilot and be after it. Right, right, right. Like I'm never disowning its people. We cannot disown people in the cockpit. Okay. But you know that there are the instances when the air forces have disowned the pilots also. When they go for spying, when they go for reconnaissance, at that time they say, we don't know who this person is. But anyway. That is beside the point. What else? So there is one thing, less liability. Anything else? As a designer, what are you getting as a benefit? One is no ACS, higher maneuverability, less, uh, less uh, system in the cockpit. What else? The range, uh, the endurance is not no more decided by the fatigue of the pilot. Okay. So if you have a single pilot cockpit, you are right. The endurance is not a function of the pilot's capability. That is why global hawk can fly 48 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours non-stop. It will be difficult with the pilot. Right? What else? Something more fundamental you are forgetting. And the answer is in the picture. Hmm? Height of the plane. Yes. Because the cockpit has to have visibility. So there is a bubble kind of a thing there that also creates a stealth problem because the canopy has a glint that can detect the aircraft. Plus, there is a bulbous thing in the front because the pilot sits there. You are right. So, very good. You observe that the aircraft is smaller in the vertical dimension. What else do you see? The answer is in the bottom. In this view, there is one answer which is not possible if you have a pilot. Exactly. The intake, the intake is where the pilot sits. This is the engine intake. In a manned aircraft, you have to have the intake below the pilot like in F-16, okay, or above the pilot if you want, but that's a problem. I have never seen any intake above the pilot because the canopy has to be ejected in case pilot wants to leave. And then if you put the engine behind the pilot, then it is in the area which is disturbed. So it's on the side of the pilot. Okay. So, the location of the engine intake is elsewhere, but the best place for the intake is right in the front, least possible inlet losses, most efficient configuration. So, you knock off the pilot, you knock off the constraint of having a limitation on the location of the inlet. So, in this case for example, they have gone for a inlet in the front. So, the engine is somewhere here and right through there is a beautiful flow. So, there are many advantages of removing the pilot from the aircraft and bringing the pilot down in the form of a remotely controlled pilot or an autonomous system. But, you know, it is easier said than done. And only when we reach that level of expertise where we can hope to do all the uh, controls, all the maneuvers, all the decision making in real time during combat. Now, many people are saying that modern day combat pilots do not need real time decision making because even the armament is supposed to be fire and forget type. It is programmed to go and hit the target. So all you are doing is going somewhere near the region, launching it and then going back. In some cases, you actually go turn back and then launch the um, uh, armament. The armament goes back and hits the target. 
So there are many people who say that the role of air to air combat, dog fight, one on one is reducing. Therefore, what is the need to have a pilot on board? But for every application you cannot uh, have that. Okay. So in this case, the vertical tail is removed for stealth and the direction control comes from these deflections of the trailing edge which is coordinated. So this pendulum wing is like a gull wing, like a gull wing and the deflection of the tip portions can be done to provide the required, I mean it is not easy to do this but if you knock the vertical tail off, so I asked you a question about some aircraft which do not have vertical tail, this is one of them, which does not have a vertical tail. Okay. Then you know about micro AVs, okay. micro aerial vehicles or MAVs, a lot of work is happening on MAVs also in our department. Okay. So uh, there are aircraft like Black Widow which have become very standard, you can have it on the palm, you can just launch it like this, it goes and does the work and comes back. So you can see 6 inch span fixed wing aircraft and it can fly for around 22 minutes, it can go to 10 kilometer and the weight is 60 grams. So such aircraft are no longer in drawing board, they are already there. So this is only for you to read when we uh, upload the slides. Okay. We will do it today, actually there was a request from a student that I don't upload the slides, I was waiting for the whole lecture to be over, I will do it now, just after the class I will do it now. And then Professor Mason has given some suggestions on which are the good books for you to read if you want to understand more about the aircraft configuration choices. Uh, Darren Stinton's book is extremely good, very few equations, it is more like a novel descriptive, but it is very anecdotal because this person is himself a very good pilot. But this book is limited to only small aircraft, general aviation aircraft. So if you want to get an idea about design of small aircraft, two-seater, four-seater, single-seater, then the book by Stinton is very nice. There is also a book by Stinton on design of the aircraft. Now, for those of you who are interested in knowing about combat aircraft, the book by Ray Whitford is very, very interesting. I have a copy of this book with me. So Ray Whitford's book is very interesting because many features of military aircraft, why they are, are explained very nicely in this book, along with photographs, along with sketches. The book by Daniel Raymond is very popular and it is uh, one of the standard texts that we have recommended in this course also. In one, of the, in one of the new editions, there are two new chapters, one on special consideration from stealth point of view, from production uh, and uh, reliability point of view, and then there is a chapter on unique aircraft concepts. Okay. And then there is a series of books by Jan Roscombe. Jan Roscombe has given uh, volume 1 to volume 8, book called Aircraft Design, volume 1 to volume, there are 8 books actually. Uh, and in chapter 3, he talks specifically about some unusual configurations. So these are very good sources for information for further reading on this. Okay. In the end, we need to understand that do not think that people have already done, there is nothing remaining, what new can I do, is there any room for me to come up with new ideas, is there any scope for bringing in new aircraft, it is not final. Okay. The question is you must be able to justify it. And because I like it is no justification. It looks good on paper is no justification. Some reasoning, some argument is very important for you to be able to do it. So next topic that we will do in the next class would be on the layout. So we have already looked at configuration. Now we look at layout and after layout we start calculating. Enough of descriptive things. Okay. So after the next chapter which is also a little bit descriptive, I will ask you to bring calculators in the class so that we can start from numbers. Design is not just listening and stories, design is calculating and estimating. So we will do our first estimation subsequently. Alright, see you and thank you.